Hello, Satan. This is Do Detective Ben Dover, re reporting for duty, because I know that you wanted to talk to me again with a Jim Carrey movie as the one you're speaking about on the Stay Report. I have to say, Mr. Detective Ben Dover, there are much better Jim Carrey characters that I could be talking to right now besides you. For instance, Cuban Pete. <laughs> oh, just give me one second, and I'll put on this mask. I, 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 I. Hello, and welcome to the Say Report. I'm your host, Devin Decker, and joining me, uh, not aware of this bit, Seijin Sarawick. <laughs> Seijin. Oh man, yeah. So we're 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 back talking about uh, talking about the year of the year of the carry. Apparently, the year of the carry, and we don't mean of Sex in the City or Mulligan. It's Jim Carrey. We're talking about Jim Carrey in yet another time capsule episode. Uh, so come with us again to 1994, where at this point, Siege and I will be honest, I've bought a house. I'm living. <laughs> That's 92. That, oh. that might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, as I cough into the microphone unprofessionally. <coughs> Yeah, coronavirus, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. We are talking... Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, it's also a time capsule of this pandemic that yeah. the country is going through right now. So hopefully we release this in, like, June and everything is better. And it's mm -hmm. not a weird time capsule of the pandemic that's going on. NCAA games are limited to only family and necessary personnel. Uh, there are no fans in the stands for the NBA. It's, yeah, it was that. today that it became a, a global pandemic Officially in the eyes labeled. of the World yep. Health Associate Organization. Or Association. It's the who, not the why. The why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's, it's weird. Like, that's what's going on around us as we decide, why don't we go into our little cubbyhole and revisit another Jim Carrey movie? And if you're going to start with Ace Ventura, you have to then go to The Mask. And... Uh, yeah, I, I actually don't disagree. Um, so one of us needs to start this, Devin. And I feel like depending on who starts this, we're going to go in wildly different directions. <laughs> well, I started so... by, by with continuity and detective and but detective Bendova. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> it's all you, buddy. Well, so, like, I, I actually, I do think that a, a legitimately important follow-up to Ace Ventura is actually going directly into the mask. Like, like, like from a from a purely academic perspective, this was a very smart move on our part, so go us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but, wait, wait to like, follow release order, guys. I, I, well, in the, the, but the reason why it's key and important <laughs> is, it, is it proves why Ace Ventura did not end Jim Carrey's career. You know, for like as much as we talked about that movie in that episode and we talked about how it, it, it did hit big and people now fondly remember it, I actually have to say I do not think it would be nearly as fondly remembered if he did not go on to have the year that he had, right? Like like that's the whole point of this little mini series that we're doing here. Um and I think that the mask is the saving grace of Ace Ventura. Um because you basically have Jim Carrey being let loose to do the kind of comedy that kind of almost the exact same kind of comedy that he was doing in Ace Ventura um, to a fault in some places and doing it cleaner, better, safer, and all around more successfully. I think like, like I, I think that, that I am coming at this movie and this is why I said we might go in wildly different directions is I am coming at this movie as viewing it as still a pretty successful little piece of film. I am not saying that makes it like good. I'm not saying that that necessarily makes it like like a bastion of like 90s comedy in any way. Like like it just it definitely it succeeds in all of the ways that I felt Ace Ventura actually kind of fell on its face. Funny you should mention that Seijin because the big winner in the game of the mask, right? Mm -hmm. Is New Line Cinema. Mm -hmm. Because we're gonna, I'm going to take you back just a little bit uh, to the fact that New Line Cinema is the reason why all of these indie comic books get these big screen movie adaptations. I mean, it's because Batman does so well, right? right. And New Line does that thing that I don't know if you've noticed. New Line always does, where once a once something hits big, New Line runs in and just buys it up. Look at the the book to movie craze of the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Like, like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, New Line did that so like batman hits big 
and the turtles are already big as like a kid's property and that's when they decide oh we're gonna get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and we're gonna release a, a film that's like a little bit adult and edgier the way that Batman was compared to the 1967 series right uh, 1964 67 is the movie um and so they do that, but then Ninja Turtles hits for them in such a big way that they also say, there are a lot of these independent comic books that are out there. We don't need to try to be Batman. We can make a Spawn movie. We can make a Mask movie. We can, I, I'm fairly certain they had their fingers involved in Mystery Men, right? Mm -hmm. Like they decided there's all of these things that we can adapt that the rights are not as expensive as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hell, I, I can't imagine how much it costs them to, to like, license out the mask from Dark Horse Comics. Uh, I don't know. It's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting question because the mask was relatively popular for Dark Horse. Like, out of Dark Horse's line, definitely one of the more popular ones. But it was very limited. Because um, how much of the comic series do you, are you, like, like, yeah. The the stuff that I know about the comic book series is the initial four the four issue run. So spoilers, obviously, in case you wanted to go read it, uh, the initial four issues that end with Stanley Ipkiss being murdered by his girlfriend Kathy and her stealing the mask, and then there is a second four issue series. These are the ones that have released prior to the movie coming out, right, where right. she is the mask. She becomes the big head killer and goes on a rampage. So she kind of does yeah she, it's she pretty quickly gives it up and hands it off to the cop in this story uh and he actually ends up becoming the mask for a bit um but upon realizing that he's gone too far he literally um <laughs> buries it in cement um and then you know later iterations like he finds out that he didn't do a good enough job but, but that's a whole other thing but yeah so so she does end up taking the mask for uh, an issue or two and then the, the cop ends up taking the mask for the rest of it and then he ends the story quote unquote by uh by burying the fucker um yeah. the entire time there there is one particular mob character that is Walter. following the whole time. Walter yeah yeah um and and he's a pretty big character because he yeah, is he's the like only... based on Frankenstein. No, I'm only well, kidding. Right. <laughs> well, he, is, he is the only character in the universe that can actually, like, damage the mask. Like, he is something kind of weirdly... Like, they... <laughs> he, is, he is just below Supernatural in that story, right? Um, so, yes. So, these are all of the stories that exist of the mask up yeah, to this point. And, he, and as you pointed out, we're really only talking about eight to ten issues. Right. Yeah, um, I didn't... I, I forgot about Callaway. A couple of, a couple of like... Um, a couple of like strip runs early on that are actually lost to time because they were in like uh, basically the American version of Shonen Jump in the in the <laughs> late eighties. Like <laughs> that's how Dark Horse kind of like started a lot of these like indie lines is they would show up in these like these anthology issues and like show up for just like two pages or three pages. Um, and so there were a few issues. Uh, there were a few stories of the mask before all of this that the creator actually kind of like purposely has buried because he's just not very proud of them. So like, that's all that exists of this story to this point is like 10 issues really that the, that the creator even acknowledges. Yeah. And so that's the thing. But the reason why I say dark horse is the real winner in all of this is the mask is filmed and ready for release in 1993, but they mm -hmm. decide to delay it. Yeah. And because of that delay, Ace Ventura comes out in February of 1994. So they paid like $45,000 to have Jim Carrey in the mask. And then he becomes an overnight sensation with Ace Ventura. And they reap all the fucking rewards of this cheap little comic book yeah. adaptation film that summer. But in terms of what's going on in the movies, there is so much more for Jim Carrey to do as a character in the mask. And you almost feel like, like it clearly came before Ace Ventura because he's so, especially when he is Stanley, right? Like, like he is, he's legitimately two characters in this movie. You have to view him as two different characters in this movie. Oh, you mean 79% and... of the movie? Yeah, yeah. I did the math. I'm a loser. <laughs> I'm a crazy person. Um, but... but he, so, so him as Stanley is much more of like, you're really kind of starting to see some of the stuff that you see later on with him and things like the majestic or, or Truman show or, or even, I mean, and even early on in some of his stuff, like he's the one in once bitten, isn't he? Yes. Like, yeah. Like, like you, you do see that he has this, like 
this desire to be something more than just like the, the guy talking out of his butt, which is what he ends up doing for all of Ace Ventura. Um, and in a weird way, you, you you kind of start to feel bad for Jim Carrey, the actor, in watching these movies because you can see how like the world just like meshed like like pinned him into this like corner of being this guy for a little bit and it's why i think i enjoyed this movie uh, so much more than i enjoyed uh ace ventura and and you you mentioning that it was filmed actually prior to ace ventura makes so much sense because like he wasn't he wasn't pigeonholed yet he was not put in that position where he had to be the funny guy he was just allowed to be funny in the moments when he needed to be Right, and I think that's the reason why they went with Jim Carrey for this particular piece. Um, I mean, they even say, like, the, the writer of the script said that he wrote it with Jim Carrey in mind. And, and, and reading the script, Carrey felt that way. But like I said, only 21% of this movie features the mask. Mm -hmm. And the mask is sprinkled through there. Like, I think the most screen time that he ever has is uh, four minutes. Yeah. Like four yeah, the, solid minutes. The character is in no way subtle. The character of the mask is not subtle. So when I use that word in the next sentence, like, don't fucking roast me. I know this. But it is a much more subtle comedy than Ace Ventura. <laughs> yes. No, you're not wrong. And that's, but that's exactly what I'm saying. But I mean, for Jim Carrey to read the script and feel like, I feel like this was written for me, mm -hmm. he can't be talking about that 21%. He right. has to be talking about the entire script. Mm -hmm. So I 100% I agree that he comes to this film thinking, I'm actually going to be able to act. I mean, this is a guy who showed up in the Deadpool, the, the <laughs> last Dirty Harry film, and yeah, had, yeah, like, yeah. an actual role. He, he's not he's not funny, funny guy in the Deadpool. Like, no, I mean, he's... He, I mean, he's straight up charming in, like, some of his moments, especially when he starts gaining a little bit more confidence, like, mid-movie. Like, the mask has kind of started to kind of rub off on him a little bit, but he has not gone, like, full crazy with it, um, which he never in the movie ever does. Like, Stanley in the comics, like, the whole point of Stanley in the comics is he goes too far, um, but the movie very much dials that back. And, like, he, and so when he gets to that moment when, like, he has a little bit of scruff on him and, like, he's coming to work with a little less well put together, he has that freak out moment on his boss. Like, like, that... <laughs> That Jim Carrey is actually like leading man Jim Carrey. Like, like you can see why he gets to be like the leading man of three movies this year. Yeah, I mean it's and and that Jim Carrey, you can see the movies that I have more of a fondness for. Mm -hmm. That's the Jim Carrey. That's liar liar Jim Carrey. That's yes, yes man Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. That's Bruce Almighty Jim Carrey. That is overwhelmed every man. Right. If you're right. going to divide I'm with Dick and Jane, I mean, like, yeah. like he has so many good movies where he gets to do this. Like, I can be funny, but also like grounded in a reality, guys. Like, I don't need to be the fucking clown. Yeah, I can be stressed out. And mm -hmm. really, I mean, if you're if you're going to look at the Jim Carrey career as the three Stillers, right? Overwhelmed right. every man, uh, crazy psychopath, and Derek Zoolander. <laughs> It, overwhelmed every man is the mask. Um, over the top guy is Lloyd Christmas in Dumb and Dumber, which we'll get to. And then his Derek Zoolander is Ace Ventura. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's and that's just the fact of, of what that is. You have that one character that everybody knows you have. You have that over the top stuff, which... Despite the fact you only did it for two movies, it is like the character everybody re is going to remember right. you for. And that's and that's, <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing. So, like, this is his overwhelmed every man. And that you're right. You're not wrong. That's the reason why he does it. Like, I, I, I was thinking the whole time, I really liked this movie when it was remade as Yes Man and they got rid of all the magic. I really <laughs> liked this movie when it was remade as Bruce Almighty and leaned heavier into the magic. Um, like it's, it's so is that what it falls apart for you? Like, like I need to know like the moment when it, it, it you can't okay. take it anymore. What the moment where I can't take it anymore. The moment where fuck this is, I uh, got those concert tickets you wanted. Okay. All right. Here it is. Here is my mask. Problem. So like 20 minutes into the movie, not, not even, even. Minutes, not the even mask doesn't show up until 18 minutes into the movie. And it's well before like the That's mask. True. The mask kills a man in the first five minutes of this movie, and then, and then we don't the see it. Mask. The mask. Okay, the big head killer, right? Because we're both familiar with the comics, so let's just use it. Big head killer doesn't show up until 18 minutes and 34 seconds into this film. Yeah. So, <clears throat> there's like 
a good chunk, like 10 minutes where you're with Stanley Ipkiss, and I hated him. And I hated him because he was the, like, classic 90s guy. He was the Ross Geller. He was this, like, I'm a nice guy. Why isn't that enough for people? And it's just right, like... Right. And he is the he's the epitome of the nice guy trope that we now cringe at because we know what those guys actually are. At the time it was charming, but now we know that it's all just it's a fucking ploy that yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's and it and it did not work for me as this character and I tried to look at it from at every possible angle. Like why does this bother me as much as it is? Is it just the cringe because we now know that that trope is so toxic? And I'm like, no, no, no. I think A is the fact that we're coming off of Ace Ventura where he played a living god, right? I think I don't think <laughs> anyone will disagree that Ace Ventura is a living god. No, I think our argument <laughs> for that is pretty sound. Anyone that disagrees can go back and listen to the, to the last bottled episode. Lace is out. Um, and, and that's the thing. He's a living god. And so for him to go from, like, literally alpha plus plus to, like, bottom of the beta was really like first of all i i can't I, i'm smart enough to separate and be like this is jim carrey being a good actor like this is this is why he's able to do the majestic this is why he's able to do films that have real meat right mm -hmm. but oh, it, stanley's a shit character though. Stanley, stanley is a shit yeah. character but what i what i eventually realized as i continued watching this film is the mask for me is not the 1994 film the mask for me is the CBS animated series. <laughs> Fair enough. Where Stanley Ipkiss is he that show, right? I mean that's what that's what got me into the comic, right? This movie didn't get me to read the comic. Seeing Walter and wanting to know more about Walter is what got me to read the comics. And that is front and center in the animated series. Yeah, and the, the, animated the animated series why, weirdly bridges the gap between the movie and the comic universe in a very clean way. Yeah, and not and, and and considering you didn't have much more Stanley to go on, but they also do this really good thing where Stanley is not the worst; like he is more than capable in that series, and mm -hmm. you're supposed to believe it's a continuation from this movie, and. Really, what watching this movie felt like was, oh, I watched a cartoon series about this character as a kid, and now there's finally going to be a big screen live action adaptation. And I know that's not the case. I, I'm smart enough to know that the, the movie came first and the kids animated series came second. Yeah. But through a nostalgia lens, which yeah. we do with the, always do on which the show. Which is what this like, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It was, it, it, it honestly felt like it's like they've taken all these characters that I've grown to love and care about, and this is how they're portraying them on the big screen. Yeah. And it was weird. It was weird to watch the film and feel that way, because I wasn't expecting it at all. I was expecting to be able to divorce myself from that series, but no, that series hit me at like the perfect age to be just formulative enough in yeah. how I like en envision and imagine things. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, yeah, and uh, no, I mean, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. no, no. That's it. Like it's you know, it was, it's time for you to talk. <laughs> because I I I don't disagree that like who he is in the beginning of this movie is is upsetting. I I think that I think there's enough of a character arc for a, and this is a lot of caveats. So like you yeah. know take this for what it will. But but for a '90s comedy, <laughs> like for a '90s PG-13 comedy for what we needed out of our, our male leads in those moments, like, there's actually a little bit more of a character arc than one would expect. Because we talked about in Ace Ventura how there's literally none. He learns nothing by the end of that movie, right? Whereas in this, and there's two moments specifically. Again, the moment in the beginning with the concert tickets, which I think is definitely a shit moment where, like, you're just like, oh, you're that guy, right? Like, you're just, you're, the only reason you're letting her take this ticket is because you really just, you want to get in her pants. Like, that is that is the motivation for this moment. And then the final moment, the, the other moment is on the back end of the film where you kind of see him come around and become a much more capable human is the fist fight with, uh, with what's his nuts with there Dorian. in the casino yeah, well, with Dorian. Like... When he, when he finally gets that good punch in at the end specifically, there's a couple of moments where he's like, I'm winning, which I gotta tell you, I fucking loved that, that moment when he was not the mask and fighting Dorian was 
I, I don't know why I didn't remember that part. And I think this speaks to like going back and watching this movie now as an adult, because like I have not seriously sat down and watched The Mask since I was younger, you know, I, I, teens, maybe, maybe early 20s. But like seriously sat down and watched The Mask. This is the first time since I was really like younger. And I connected so much more with Stanley than I did with The Mask this time around. When I was a kid, all I cared about was the scenes when he was green. Like I was like, fast forward this. I don't care about these parts. So the moment when he gets into that fight with Dorian at the end and specifically when he gets that last punch in and gets him and knocks him back and there's this weird there's this weird effect that they do where it seems almost cartoonish except he's not in the mask so it's not over the top cartoonish so it's like this again this weird middle ground between Stanley and and Big Head that like I I very much enjoyed and seeing those two scenes right like the concert tickets and the punch like I just I like the character. I think that he comes around for me in by the end of the movie. And then to see in the in the in the TV show when he is much more capable and has a lot more control or at least attempts a lot more control over Big Head like is is something else. And then and then you get to the comics where like the whole point is is that he tries to wrest that control and never can and loses it to the point where his girlfriend I, like we we talked about how he gets killed by his girlfriend in that comic. She does it because he has just gone on a rampage and killed 11 cops. Like that yeah, like that is that is what has happened in the comic books. He he has finally gone over the edge and has started killing innocent people, and that is when she decides that she needs to, to do it. But the only way she can do it is by wearing the mask herself. And like it's it, it is it, it's I mean like that as a character, it's a phenomenal story. It really is. Like the, the the comic is so good, and I guess that's sort of where it not where it lost me because I I mean that that whole thing where she's like I know what I have to do, but I can't do it as myself. Like, it's this beautiful thing, and this movie doesn't have that. But I feel like this movie well, would just, go ahead, yeah. like, a little bit more effort could have had some more, like, more of a satisfying catharsis that I don't really get until the series, which is why I think, as a kid, the series is what I glommed onto. I tell you where the movie probably fucked up for you, and you probably didn't even notice it. There is clearly a moment where Peggy's role was meant to be the end of the movie, and they realized they had this thing with Cameron Diaz playing Tina, and they switch up the turnabout. The, 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 the moment when he gets given up to Dorian, I guarantee you in early versions of the script that was Tina in that moment and not Peggy, and it is Peggy later on that gets kidnapped. Yeah, there's there's no doubt and, in my mind because it came from and, nowhere, and it, it especially and I, came from nowhere because yeah. in the cartoon series, and I know I'm going to be referencing a lot, but like that, you need to understand that's my biggest baseline with this. She mm -hmm. is his closest friend and confidant. Peggy. Yeah, Peggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, and in and in, in, in if you think about it in terms of in the comics, like like she's Peggy's not a character from the comics, but she's very much a surrogate for that like basically that conscience that 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 other figure in his life who was trying to, you know, make him better, but also like, but keep a check, keep him in check. Like Peggy is clearly meant to be the role that he the, the, supposed to be the person that he ends up with at the end of this movie. And there is so clearly a moment when they were like, oh, this scene is supposed to be Tina turning on him, and they straight up play. <laughs> the song that plays when Tina first shows up in the movie is uh, is the song they they never warn you. I, I don't know the actual title of it. Um, Seth Seth MacFarlane does a beautiful version of it. It's like an old Sinatra tune, and they do an instrumental version of it. But um, all is fair in love and war, and they never warn you is basically like the lines of the song, and that's what's playing when she shows up. So like. It is almost like they, they filmed the movie and edited most of it until they decided, oh, wait, she's going to be the one he ends up with. Because they're building her up so much to be this thing that's like, she's dangerous, man. She's beautiful, but she's going to fuck you over. And then she kind of never does. Like, she's, like, super supportive of him throughout the whole movie. There's never a moment for her where she, like, turns on him. And so for me, that's where any form of, like, catharsis kind of goes out the window for me is is um, is in specifically that story where it's just like, oh, like, the woman that was kind of nice to him before he was the mask is actually a bitch because she, like, turns him over to this guy. And she's all surprised that he's going to kill him. Like, are you that stupid? You're a friggin' reporter. Like, and then, meanwhile, the woman who only fell in love with him for real when she saw him as the mask and, like, weirdly is into him being super sexually aggressive with him when he's the mask, she's the one that she that decides to be with him in the end. That doesn't, that doesn't jive for me. Yeah, okay. I, I mean... The thing is, that, that turn where it was Peggy who was bad, I'm like, this makes no sense. 
Was she there hiding to see him put on the mask? How does she know? I saw everything. I know everything. How? How do you know everything? There's exactly. no way that you could have this information. And it just, it was so strange to me. But what is stranger, what is stranger still is that there is a scene. It is on the Blu-ray. It is on the DVD where Dorian picks up Peggy and throws her into the printing press and kills her. Yep. And they're like, no, 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 no. We can't kill Peggy because what if we want to use her in the next movie? And it's like, then why did you treat her like garbage? Why did you ruin her characterization? I don't think it's a matter of wanting to use her later. I think it's a matter of toning it down for a PG-13. Oh, no, they're, 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 but there are on record saying that they didn't want to eliminate the character in case of a sequel. And that's the reason why they cut it. That's and ridiculous. That's that's ridiculous to me. Because also, it would be this this serious moment where, like, why does Dorian put on the mask at that moment? Like, why does he become his version of the big head killer? And then he does nothing. Like, it's all ominous. The fucking smoke cloud. Like, goddamn. There's so much potential. There's yeah. so much potential in that character yeah. putting the mask on. And the fact that it goes nowhere is so disappointing. Like, if he, if, if it was him and you throw it and it's like, the mask is not funny anymore because it just murdered a woman. They eliminated the stakes. They eliminated the stakes by getting rid of that scene. Am I glad mm -hmm. they got rid of that scene? Yes, because Peggy fantastic character in the animated series yeah, so like I, I, they I saved her the, for that yeah and i think the underlying tone i think the thing that they're not saying because they can't say this out loud is it was originally supposed to be tina in that scene and killing tina made sense yes imagine if tina didn't exist for the rest of the movie that's fine but the second that they're like "Ooh, this cameron diaz thing we gotta we gotta keep that going so let's put her in this role let's 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 manipulate the story in this way and then uh oh peggy dying though that seems gross like 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 that's when they take that step back it's it's all in that same decision making process of like the second it's no longer tina in that role it no longer makes uh, it no longer makes enough financial sense. It no longer makes enough like like story driven sense to necessarily have to kill Peggy, because um, it would have been too far for me. If if they had killed it and it was Peggy, if they had killed her and it was Peggy, it would have been too far for me. Because like despite what was happening in that moment, it was happening so fast. I still hadn't come around to like hating her, right? <laughs> so to have to see her then get killed would have been upsetting in a pg-13 comedy it, it would not have worked for me i'll be entirely honest so it is um, pg-13 i was gonna ask for that confirmation because yeah because it's I can... definitely not r but like it feels like it flirted with r in a way that i was un like i, I didn't remember the yeah. the r flirtation like when he pulls out the condom which that yes. was apparently improvised i don't know how you improvise that scene like, I could see him coming up with the joke, which they say that he came up with jokes that then showed up in the movie. And I'm like, I could see him coming up with, well, I should pull out a condom and say wrong pocket. But, like, how do you improvise that on set? As, yeah, it, at, yeah, with yeah. all the know, CG right? and like, everything, like, well, with everything, with everything that's going on, and the and the way that there's no way that what well, improv might have meant something different. Yeah, it just, <laughs> you know. Like, maybe he improved the line on a table read, and it made, like, it just was weird. Because I think that's another thing that is really a boon to this, is because for so much of it, he is this straight-laced, for, for lack of a better word, real character, he doesn't have a lot of room to improvise, where Ace Ventura, he was just set out too rabidly. Yeah. Like, everything so he says feels like an improvisation in, in Ace Ventura. So I feel like we haven't done, like, a quick rundown of the plot this time, like oh, we did yeah, with Ace Ventura, yeah. but that's because Ace Ventura is so plot, like, the, the plot is significant because it's a mystery story. In this, it's pretty straightforward. Stanley Ipikis is a dopey guy that, like, finds himself caught up in this story of the mob trying to steal from the bank that he works at. He discovers a mask at the same time. He puts the mask on and saves the day. Now, <laughs> that being said... The way that this story is touted everywhere you go, IMDb, like the, the fucking back of the box on the VHS, like they talk about this being a superhero story. And I take real issue with that. Even in the movie, there's a moment where he talks about himself being a superhero. I could be a superhero. But the I mask, can... like Big Head talking about himself that way, like the mask character talking about himself that way never bothered me. And the way that like hearing people outside of the movie talk about this being a superhero film really kind of bothers me. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
let me talk about why I think this movie bothers me. I think that you've brought up some really good points. I think that I've given my, like, actual, if there had to be qualitative, uh, quantitative data, it would be that I, I care more for the, the characterization in the comic books and the cartoon and the comic book than as it's presented in this film. But what really bothers me about this film is I have no fucking clue what the rules are. I have no idea what the rules of the mask in universe are mm. at all mm. because all you get is conjecture from Stanley with the whole, I think it brings your, your deepest desires to the surface. Right. Right. Um, which that's fine, but, but also I, I don't know. I don't see that because there also oh, yeah. seems to be a level of like, Stanley having memory of what he does as the mask, which yeah. always seemed like, I mean, it's a really big driving point in the comic book series because I mean, and it has to be a point of the film too, because his confidence as the mask is what eventually makes him a more confident human being. And that's why he's able to beat up Dorian. And that's why he's able to get the girl, which still gross i i I can't i can't look away from yes Um, right 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 for sure there's yeah i so so like i think this ties into the superhero stuff right the thing about a superhero movie is there's always that scene where they lay the rules out of like okay here's like it's usually a training montage or something like that like where the where the hero figures out what they're capable of right and in this movie it, it is literally just one scene where they attempt it and they fail at it and it is the scene with ben stein when he goes into ben stein's office and he's talking to him about the history of masks and like what it means to wear a mask it, they have a potential there to actually lay some real rules out but the shit they talk about is so weird like first of all bringing loki into it is interesting but then to just bullshit a bunch of stuff about loki and maybe this is in like the 2020 me like looking back and being like none of that is loki what are you doing but, like, the idea that he's a quote-unquote night god? Like, what? You know, just talk about him being a trickster. And sometimes the mask doesn't work because, but you, joke's on you, motherfucker. You're like, you, you thought you are going to be invincible this time, but guess what? You're not. Like, that makes much more sense to me than being like, maybe the mask only works at night. What? No. I'm a fucking idiot. I, like, I heard night guard and thought, like, K-N-I-G-H-T. That, like, he's one of the defenders of Asgard. He's a bit of a trickster, but he's a knight. I didn't realize, because the whole time I'm like, does the mask only work at night? Does it give me enough to believe that? I know that that's not the case in any other fiction that the mask exists in. Right. Like... But in the movie, I think it, I, and that's just it, is I cannot tell you definitively whether or not that's even an actual rule because it's presented as a possible rule, but then it's never like tested, it right? Is. Like there's well, never look, a moment. Where I Go became, ahead. where I wrote down is, does the mask only work at night? And then I wrote, it must, is why the fuck would Dorian take the mask off? That scene where he puts it on um, after Peggy betrays Stanley, why would he take it off? Why would he not be walking around as the character? Right? Like, imagine that moment when he's feeling all-powerful, this this unkillable god, and then suddenly, like, sunlight hits him and the mask falls off. That would have been phenomenal. That's not what happens. That's not what happens. Because he just shows up as regular Dorian again, and I'm like, why aren't you still the mask? Why aren't you still walking around like your shit don't stink? Right. And right, then I'm exactly. like, and then he, and then in the car with Cameron Diaz, he's like, it's almost time and it's getting dark. And I'm like, oh, okay. So this schmuck figured out that it only works at night one day with the goddamn thing. Stanley, who is supposed to be the one like learning it and, and finding out about it. And who in a lot of ways, it feels like the mask was searching for. Right. right? Like, all the shit where he throws it away and it comes back to him. Well, and the fact that it's not going for anybody, because, it again, I will point this out, in the first five minutes of this movie, in the first minute of this movie, the mask kills another person, because, I, I, I can only assume, because that person was not the right person to find it. This guy that is going to find it under the water has his hand on that box, and all of a sudden, something happens, and he gets killed by that pipe falling on him. The mask... I, I, I can only assume we are meant to believe the mask makes that happen. Why would the mask care unless it was the idea that it was meant for somebody in particular? Right. And and that's, yes, 
And that's yeah. the thing. Like it, it has all these moments where like, what the hell, what the hell? And like, does it do all the cartoon stuff because Stanley Ipkiss is a fan of cartoons? Right. Like, is that is that the only thing? Like, because subconsciously yeah, I, I love know. cartoons. Like, I mean, unless we're to believe that Milo also loves cartoons. Well, Milo watches a lot of cartoons as Stanley Ipkiss' is really only real friend. Yeah, yeah, possible. It's just it, the, the the rules. That's that's just it, right? Yeah. Is they they establish rules but they don't give them any solid foundation so like it's all it's a house built on sand right so like at any moment you're just waiting for the whole thing to just fall apart and it never does i will give it that like the movie never really falls apart but you're always kind of just like in the background wondering when it will yeah and that and that's that's not fun. It, it's hard for me to get invested in it. Uh, yeah. Also, another moment that would have worked along... Well, it couldn't have worked because... Why the fuck does he take the mask off after Cuban Pete? Why the fuck does he take the mask off after Cuban Pete? It makes no sense. It's just so that he's vulnerable when Peggy turns on him. Yeah. It, it's like, they know that they're the same person. Regert, uh, Peter Regert, uh, Kellaway, uh, Lieutenant Kellaway, has already made that connection. Phenomenal in this movie, by I the way. I forgot that it was Peter he's, Regert. He's so good. He's, he's so, so good. good. I love thing. Peter yeah. Regert. He, he's so good, and he's so good as this well, character. Well, and like, in, in like, if they ever had done a sequel, like, weirdly, he would have had to have put the mask on eventually, right? Because Kellaway is the, is the cop in the book that ends up putting the mask on, like... <laughs> yes! So, like, that would have been so good to see, like, a Cameron Diaz mask, to see him wearing a mask, like, it's part of the reason why I actually really like the idea that uh, that Dorian gets the mask at some point is because it's such an important part of the story, uh, it, of the source material, that, like, anybody can put the mask on. So, like, the fact that Milo gets to wear it, the fact that Dorian gets to wear it, the fact that we see Stanley put it on, like, that is actually a very cool element of this movie that I, I do want to, like, applaud. Oh, yeah, it's it's one of the things that the film that the film does great. And because of that, that they do it so well in the, the series... Because the, the litany of people who wear the mask in the animated series always blew me away as a kid. That, like, because the movie, like we said, it's it, they're not hard and fast rules, but in a lot of ways, it feels like it's meant for Stanley. Yeah. And, and that, like, no one else should be able to use it. So then you see Dorian in it, and you're like, okay, well, that then clearly that's out the window. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, like... It's just so weird. And you know what's weirder is all of the material about this movie talks about Kathy and how Kathy was turned into Tina, but really Kathy was split into Peggy and Tina, both <laughs> characters who never existed before this movie came along. Right. I don't know. It's just, it was so strange watching yeah. this movie and feeling like, I feel like they failed, but they can't have failed because this film be like is the reason why I have what came after it. And let me let me propose this. Yeah. I think that honestly, a lot of the stuff that you've mentioned about the weirdness of this movie and how it doesn't click can all really be focused on the idea that it was nineteen ninety four. No? Yeah. Like a lot of the decisions that get made, a lot of the choices that get made that we have pointed to as being kind of the upsetting choices in this movie, I don't think they happen if that movie was made in 2004. I don't think it happens if that movie is made in 1984. You know what I mean? Like like I think I think 1994 there was such a weird element to movie making as we have kind of talked about in this exploration of the year that like I think a lot of this stuff has to do with just the toxicity of the time and, like, the the weirdness of, like, what are we doing? Like, what are we putting on screen in front of us? What are we consuming? What are we What are we remembering? What are we raising our children on? And all of this is, like, is it's, it's just the 90s, man. A lot of this is just the 90s. And I think that's what makes me more upset. Like, I'm, I'm using the mask as a punching bag, and that's not right. I understand that it's not right. But, like, I remember, like, this has to be one of those formulative things in my mind with how, like, I thought was the proper way to approach a female. 
like Charlie smelling that sh- the the shirt that she wore. Like it's right. all this stuff where I'm just like, media had such a negative effect on on children, <laughs> primarily males, in the fucking nineties. And I, it's it's I terrifying. Love, yeah, man. I love Richard Jenny. I, I loved Richard Jenny when he was alive and his death was legitimately upsetting to me one of the first like upsetting comedy deaths to me when i when i was growing up um had to like weirdly revisit it in like a stand-up class once like i i love the dude but holy crap his character in this movie is the fucking worst his character is it is and he's supposed to be like the and he's supposed to be like the goofy friend that like you're supposed to that you're just supposed to love like he's the he is the version of of stanley that we want stanley to become by the end of it and i'm not saying that that is true i'm saying that's what should be (laughs) that should be the case but i do not want stanley to become him by the end of this movie right it's it's weird like in, in in a lot of ways Stanley Ipkiss is the comedy friend and mm-hmm. Charlie is the lead. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, but their friendship is so nice. Like their friendship, like where he's like, I got tickets to this charity ball. You want to be my date? Like, that's a legitimately nice human moment for Charlie. And it's like, but everything else you've done up to this point is fucking gross. Like no, I, I mean, wrote the, the, you the off. Treatment- Specifically, the treatment of women in this movie is, like, upsetting. Like, if I was to point to, in Ace Ventura, we said, you know, the treatment of, like, trans identity is, is like, probably the, the greatest offense in that film. <laughs> yeah. I think I think in this film, if you had to point to a timely offensive thing, it is definitely the treatment of women in this film. is just completely off its rocker. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll sign off on that. I'll co-sign that, that theory. That that is true. It's not even a theory. It's It's women are treated horribly in this film. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't, oh. Oh, the Cuban Pete, right? Which like is such an iconic scene. Chick, chick, mm-hmm. boom, chick, chick, boom, chick, chick, boom. Um, when he like brainwashes the female officer, I'm yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is gross. Yep. Like this. Uh, I mean, look no further than the park scene. Like yeah. the, 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 the back and forth the, with the Pepe Le Pew scene, scene is, or before. Yeah. No, the 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 Pepe Le Pew stuff, it, like it is a straight up rip off of Pepe Le Pew style comedy, which we also now recognize as being super upsetting. Like, it, yeah, it's it's it, it, it's phenomenal. <laughs> like looking back on it and ever thinking, like, oh, this is we thought this was okay. We all agreed that this was funny. All right. Yeah, it's um. So there, so there's a, another question, right? It can't just be that it's 1994. It has to also be that this particular vehicle for Jim Carrey was also borrowing very heavily from animations that we now recognize are problematic. Mm -hmm. Because let's also talk about nostalgia for Looney Tunes was at an all-time high. We've discussed this a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he, he borrows heavily from Bugs Bunny in his death scene. There's that Pepe Le Pew scene. I mean, he does Tex Avery's wolf character. I mean, that's really the only Tex Avery thing. I felt like there was one other one. Um, are you thinking about, uh, I don't even, we've done such a good job not bringing it up, but are you talking about the fact that there's the main character of Son of the Mask is literally named after Tex Avery? No, I wasn't oh, going to okay. bring up Son of the Mask. It's okay. It's the last <laughs> time we have to talk about it this entire episode. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, that's, I was trying to think of uh, other, oh, Tasmanian Devil, which she's not oh, really the, a problematic the, the, character. The, 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 but yeah. no, but 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 like the use of him. It, I mean, he is he is the first character that that gets spoofed. Yes. Like the the very first time Stanley puts the mask on, he spends five fucking minutes t- doing a Tasmanian Devil impression around the room, like <laughs> to the point where there's even a Taz pillow to remind you, like, hey, this is the character that we're we're referencing. <laughs> he spends fifteen seconds. It He's like not even minutes. the mask for five minutes in that thing. He is the mask for four minutes and 26 seconds the first time he puts the mask on. <laughs> I did it. I did the math because I'm like, I need to know. Because the big issue for me, right, is the mask storyline in a lot of ways, right? It's classic allegory. It's borrowing pretty heavily from Jekyll and Hyde. But the question is, what if Jekyll wasn't that nice a guy, Right. <laughs> Because there is that element of Stanley Ipkiss in the comic books who is very, like, he wants revenge and he feels put upon. He's not the nice guy that Jim Carrey's Stanley Ipkiss is. There are clearly some mental issues 
uh, for that character in the comic books. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's sort of the thing is that like Jekyll and Hyde, it'd be great to be Hyde, but what if Jekyll wasn't that great a guy beforehand? How, how, how much worse would Hyde then become? And that doesn't happen. You have that in Dorian where he puts the mask on. He is still in complete control because I don't know why, because also fucking rules. Like I don't get it. I mean, we're supposed to believe that he is losing control in a few of those moments, like, specifically when, like, the eyes start to glow and stuff like that. But y- your point is taken. Like, like the idea that, like, like Stanley is not that bad to begin with, and he puts the mask on, and he doesn't become that bad of a person, right? But, like, the whole point of the mask is he is supposed to bring out your innermost desires, but also, at the same time, like twist them, warp them, turn them into something that you, you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, That's classic the, that genie. Is the moral. Yeah. <laughs> like, that is, the, that is the moral of the mask, is like, be careful what you wish for, right? And and that is not present in this movie at all. Which just seems so strange um, in, in, in so many ways. Like, because even the show, like, it bridges that gap in a lot of ways, where Stanley's like, you're going too far, I can't put you on anymore. And like, it's clearly two separate characters because they have that episode where the mask is split in two and he puts it on and they have a conversation with each other about like, if we're going to try to do good for people, we need to do good. Like we can't be hurting people the way that you have been. Right. Like, and that's, that's very early on in the series as like a way to tame him down. And that's crazy. And it's great, but it's like, I, I never believe that this Stanley Ipicus is going to get to that level. And I writ- no. I did write down like you've you've talked about a character arc and it's clearly there. Like when I wrote down, does Stanley learn anything or become a better character than he was in the beginning? He does. It doesn't really happen until the last five minutes of the film. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like yeah. like he's still kind of the same person when he's in jail. I, I yes, maybe on the jail scene. I will argue, though, like, the stuff that we see him do throughout the movie, like yelling at his boss and showing up disheveled and and a couple of other choices that he makes, shows that he is changing. Um, but, But I think the real issue is that it's not a big, it's not a very big character arc. He doesn't become a completely different person by the end of this movie. Right. So you're not wrong. But that, that moment when he's finally behind bars and in jail and, like, he is kind of just who he's always been. Well, it's because he's he's a little bit better, but it's not it's not a moment for him to show that. Yeah. It's, it's just – and that's where I'm like, did he learn anything? Because, like, yeah. there's not much yeah. time left in this movie. Right. Is there going to be a moral here? Like – Right. And and I and not that every film or or movie needs a message or a moral, but like this one, no, it doesn't have one. It just doesn't. You, well, you, it bluntly just does not. You oh, you you want everything to happen in your life? Find a magic mask. Mm-hmm. And you'll get to sleep with Cameron Diaz, maybe. I don't know if they sleep together, but they make out. <laughs> you'll, yeah, you'll... like he never there's never a moment when he I, I think that's I think that's it for me is there's never a moment where he fights with putting on the mask. He's always so eager to, you know, there's a couple of moments when he wonders if he should, but it doesn't stop him. Yeah. And that's and that's an inherent thing about the Stanley Ipkiss character, but mm-hmm. not here. Like, it's never like, do I really need it? it it'd be like a moment where like he's st- the mask still saves the day. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the mask still saves the day. It would really say something for the film and for his growth as a character in terms of courage and, like, confidence if he were able to defeat Dorian without using the mask. Right, right. And I think that's part of the reason why I like that moment so much when he punches Dorian is it clearly is a moment of Stanley (coughs) actually being the one to win the fight and not the mask. And then, you know... I think it's only after that. I think the only thing that really happens with he Dorian from that tree. moment on is he yeah. flushes him. Yeah, he flushes him down the the, the fucking drain pipe, which clearly kills him. Right, like he he is dead. Dorian is dead. Not but only does it clearly kill him, like something comes up out of the hole and then I falls tell if it was down. A gun? I couldn't was tell if it was a gun, a gun or a knife or like I thought it was a knife. And it came up, yeah. and then like it landed, and it lands in Dorian's head, and he's. You know now why that dead, joke dead, doesn't dead. work? Like let's 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 deconstruct this joke and talk about why it doesn't land. There is not a defining thing about Dorian for that to be a uh, for that joke to really work. 
like imagine if he had like a glass eye and that was what popped out or if he had like a like you know what i mean or a hook hand and that's what came out like, like there's nothing about him that you're like oh this feature like a bond villain there's this feature about him that is so like important that's what should show up at the end like that is the the third part of the joke the, the denouement right the prestige of that joke <laughs> like like it, it, and that and it and it doesn't he, dorian doesn't have one so that joke doesn't really work <laughs> Right. It's just like, oh, something came up. I bet whatever came up killed him down there. I bet that if he <laughs> somehow lived, that ended it. <laughs> yeah, he dies. Yeah, that he that dies. kills you. Um, so it is still the mask killing somebody, um, yeah. which means that if we had gotten a proper sequel and not Son of the Mask, um, we, we probably would have explored that deeper. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. You know what the weird thing about this film is? And it's very early on. It's when he's driving the loner Studebaker and he <laughs> yes, breaks yeah, down yeah. on the bridge. And the car falls apart. And the car just falls apart, yeah. Um, I, I said, this reminds me a lot of Monkey Bone. <laughs> oh, man. All right. And it, That's well, a like, it, I haven't it, heard in years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I, I love it. <laughs> like, it was this weird thing where I'm like, this is like Monkey Bone, but like, it's, I don't know, like Edge City, right? Going back to the actual comics, they're a great send-up of what comic books were, right? Mm -hmm. They're kind of the kick-ass of their time. Not that I want to compare the two, but that's fucking crazy that Jim Carrey's in kick-ass too, now that I have, <laughs> right? Yeah. But they were, I mean, what indie comic books were doing at the time were satire teardowns of what spandex comic books were. Right? right? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that first issue is a parody of Daredevil in every yep. way, shape, or form. The foot is the hand, Splinter is stick, and it's the same accident that blinded Matt Murdock that mutated the turtles. Right, right, like, right, right. <clears throat> like, that's, that's all they have admitted that, that that was their thing. We wanted to tear down Daredevil and talk yeah, about, and, like... And some more like esoteric <sighs> ones that like don't have like direct surrogates, but like Evil Ernie, uh, fucking the Darkness. Uh, what were some of those other ones that were out around that time? Like, oh, like, um, the, uh, uh, well, Flaming Carrot. I always think of like Flaming Carrot, mm -hmm. the original Deadpool. The Max. Yeah, the Max. I mean, like, um, right. Scud. <laughs> like, I mean, even Spawn, right? Like, Spawn, Spawn was was in that that family until it broke out. Like, it, yeah. it is it's really the golden child of that of that era. But like, Spawn is very much this idea of like he's imbued with power by a god. It just so happens that that god is like the devil, and his powers are hell powers. Like, yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. and that's the same thing with the mask. Like Edge City, Edge City really reminds me of the city from the Tick. Like this, mm -hmm. it, this weirdly yes. falls into the same area as the tick for me the tick. yeah hell yeah um in in terms of just like the city is kind of garbage and we know that i mean it's a real send-up of batman really what the mask is and and i could be completely wrong because i i didn't write the mask this is just my five cent fucking drop it in the can and lucy van pelt's not here so here's my analysis of the mask the mask is batman if joker were the hero so have you do you have you ever read The Mask and Joker? <laughs> no, is that a thing that exists? Yeah, it's an actual thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Joker gets a hold of the mask, and the whole point is he puts it on and really nothing changes. The only difference is he basically becomes invincible. Like, that is legitimately, like, the only change. And, I mean, I'll spoil it for you now, the way that Batman defeats him. And so so Kellaway is the only other character, I think, from the series of the mask that shows up. But he shows up in Gotham City to help out um, Batman and Commissioner Gordon, like, end this thing. Um, and the only way that Batman figures out to stop him is he convinces the Joker that the mask is, like, that he doesn't, that he's better than the mask. That he doesn't need the mask. Because, basically, the mask is, like, a one-trick pony. Whereas, like, the Joker has always been funny. And, like... That is, like, the thing that, like, the Joker realizes, like, fuck this, and takes the mask off, and then he's able to stop him. But that is, but, like, you're not the first person to recognize this. Like, it becomes such a thing that at some point they straight up meet. Right. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that, like, I'm trying to say I'm the first. I feel like that's what the intention was. No, oh, right. No, that's yeah. what I mean. It's like, it's like, they, it, it, it is this little indie thing that is clearly, so, like, giving a lot of love and a lot of criticism to, like, the Batman universe. And it becomes so big, not, not least of which because of this movie, that, and that DC ends up actually bringing it in. I think that actually, 
I think Lobo was actually the first DC character to meet the mask. And then from there, they're able to pull it into the DC universe. Well, I mean, it makes perfect sense because like what characters that the mask is compared to in terms of like his healing ability, Lobo is top of the list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because the in the I... comics, he gets hurt and like he gets hurt. There's like a visible like, oh, my God, my guts are spilling out and all that right. before, you know, comic book healing factor happens. Right. So right. it would make perfect sense to put the mask in front of Lobo. You should definitely check out the Lobo story with the mask because it ends in one of the most Lobo style endings in which Lobo basically has to fight an early version of himself wearing the mask. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, that sounds exactly <laughs> like a Lobo comic. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. So I guess at the end of the day, like it feels like it's wrap up time. Mm -hmm. the, the mask is the mask. Big head killer is such a complex character that like that I'm now aware of right at the first time I saw this movie I I don't know why I saw the mask I didn't poll people on oh, the mask the way I pulled people on Ace Ventura but like everybody saw the mask but, like <laughs> even even I who was not allowed to see Ace Ventura another PG-13 comedy that came out in the same year I was allowed to see the mask right I saw the mask in theaters I know that for a fact um I it was at the Gardner Cinema and actually, it might have been at the Lemonster Cinema. It was when I was still living in Massachusetts, obviously. And we saw it there, and, like, you know, I dug it. I really, I, I don't know, maybe I didn't dig it. I think I think I had the same issue with, like, so that movie just kind of happened, huh? <laughs> and, like, it's 101 minutes long. Mm -hmm. It is an hour and 41 minutes. So, like, I believe of all of these, that makes it the shortest one. I feel like Ace Ventura is slightly longer. I don't remember. Yeah, we'll do the research on that before Dumb yeah. and Dumber. We'll come at it with all that information. But yeah, that's the thing. So like, it almost feels like this film was done kind of dirty in its live action adaptation. But I only know that because of how I interacted with it after the fact. So mm -hmm. like, it succeeds in the fact that it brings the mask to the mainstream. It, it does this thing that, like, the Ninja Turtles cartoon did. What the X-Men cartoon did, right? Like, there's a reason why the X-Men were the first Marvel property properly adapted to the, the big screen after the, the abomination that was Howard the Duck 16 right. years earlier. Like, it's because that animated series put them in the hearts and minds of everybody in the nation. The way that that... So, The Mask as a movie succeeds... In bringing, like, spotlighting the character of the mask. It succeeds in showing us that Jim Carrey is more than just talking out of his butt. Yeah, and right. it succeeds in bringing us Cameron Diaz. Because it's her mm -hmm. first acting role. Yeah, we, we really haven't talked about it, but she's she is introduced in the credits as introducing Cameron Diaz. So, yeah, like, she's the yeah, last yeah. person credited in the cast list. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. And that's... So, like... It's an important film, I think also in terms of, like, CGI. Yep. Like CGI was not, I mean, look, it was not top of the line, but, like, it it held up. Yeah, it, it really weirdly does. The only one that didn't work for me is, look, Ma, I'm roadkill. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, the flattening of characters never works for me. They, they do the same thing in Space Jam a few years, a few years later with uh, with Michael Jordan. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea of, like, the flattening of the face, which was a trick that everybody loved at the time, does not hold up. You're, you're not wrong. <laughs> but everything else, and it's weird, because I think of, like, Little Nicky, and everybody's mm -hmm. like, Little Nicky is Adam Sandler's greatest hits. But Jim Carrey did the same thing. <laughs> because that scene with the gang in in the mask that mm -hmm. literally happens in Bruce Almighty. Uh -huh. The the scene with him like losing it on his boss that happens in Liar Liar. That happens. That happens in, in Yes Man. Man. It yeah. Yeah. like Jim Carrey plays bank people. That's what he does. I mean Truman Show is <laughs> is that exact thing, right? Where he finds out, like, the world is not what he expected it to be, and he, like, loses his mind for about 40 minutes in the middle of that movie. And then the last 20 minutes is him at sea, and I love it. But, um... <laughs> but, yeah, man, you're not wrong. The Mask is definitely... It's it's Jim Carrey basically establishing all of the stuff that we are going to get to know him for for the rest of his career. Yeah, and I'm glad. I'm glad that it happens, and you're not wrong. It, because if it were just Ace of Ventura... I don't think we'd still be talking about Jim Carrey in 2020. 
No. If the mask was not there to bridge the gap, I, I honestly don't think it would have happened. Yeah. <clears throat> and there. So that's uh so yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh what we kind of did with Ace Ventura is is it still worth watching? And is it, it, the mask it, here's still what I, worth here's watching? What... So here's here's the way that I'm going to phrase the question for this particular one. Ace Ventura, I don't think that I'd bother letting my kids watch. Like, if my kids came to me and said, I want to watch it, I'd be like, eh. Like, <laughs> I'd, I, I would have a serious thing about letting that happen. If my kids came to me and said, I want to watch The Mask, I'd let them. Like, sure, let's do this. Let's sit down and watch The Mask together, fam. Like, let's do it. <laughs> I think there's just so much good acting in the cast mm -hmm. that like and it's really great to see them all working together yeah in this way that you know you don't really see these people together i mean amy yazbeck she all but disappeared at like i love Reggie, amy yazbeck yeah i know right she did like this and men in tights all within a couple of years and then and like disappeared. problem child too yeah, yeah yeah um but like, uh reggie reggie cote like 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 he shows up like years later in so many good roles that i love him for i mean he's my legitimately my favorite part of fan four stick like like he <laughs> like there's there's just so many good moments for him uh who plays dorian what's the guy's name that plays uh, dorian? john green yeah john green like yeah. like I, I, I was the, okay did they put him in more than just face prosthetics at the end did they also put him in like a neck and like chest prosthetics? yeah i'm i don't okay that's the hardest part about it because mm -hmm. like they they say that jim carrey because of his move mobility as an actor and a human being they didn't have to do as much when he put the mask on mostly it was just the four hour application of the mask makeup but it feels like Dorian is a like half CGI character. Like <laughs> yeah, his yeah. face is clearly larger. Like he he represents the big head part of big <laughs> head for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's strange. It's it's a uh, but yeah, it's I think this one is still relevant in some ways. Uh, even if just to look at how we were telling kids to act in the 90s. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, I think if you were if you were looking at it in terms of film history and you were told you have to watch a Jim Carrey movie from 94, I think this is the one I'd tell you to watch right now. Yeah. I think, oh yeah. So if I were doing a, a film history course, right, and it was a Jim Carrey course, because you, you could have a lot of fun with that. For, yeah, man. for 94, the one I would show in class would be The Mask. And the one you'd have to write a paper on is that in your spare time, watch Ace Ventura or Dumb and Dumber. And identify something. I don't know. Right. I'm not a and, and I And I, I think I legitimately say that because Dumb and Dumber, it's not just his movie. There's so much else going on in that. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. There's so much more going on in it than just Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. Um which is key and important in his growth as an actor. But this is so much just let's put Jim Carrey on screen for, for 80 minutes and see what happens. Right. And yeah, it's, yeah, it works. And also find the animated series. I wish the animated series were somewhere. The way that you like feel. Crackle or like, or like Tubi or something like find, <laughs> find some cheap service somewhere that has a shout TV or something. And, and I bet the, you can find only it. one. Like the first season is available on DVD, but I want all of it. I want, weirdly, I also want the crossover between Ace Ventura and The Mask. Like, the only good a, episode of the Ace Ventura cartoon show. Yeah. Ugh, weird. Mm. Um, so that's the last thing. I want to leave it on theory, right? Because theory is fun. We all know that Son of the Mask exists. Mm -hmm. uh, on some level, Seijim, I believe that Ace Ventura is a living god. Because he is a son of the mask as well. <laughs> it tracks. I hate that it tracks. It's all sick. But like, flat circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. That's what I'm, I'm watching it and I'm like, holy crap. Is that what this is? Is that, is this how these two things connect? I don't know. Honestly, and I may never know because these movies are old and it's just what we're having fun doing. But if you want to tell me why I'm wrong about the movie being the weakest mask, you can find me on Twitter at Devin D. Decker. And if you, <laughs> Jamie Kenny, I'm speaking specifically to you. If you want to blow up our spot about not giving Son of the Mask its due, you can hit me up at Siege versus the World. 
Yeah. You know what? Maybe we'll look at sequels in a time capsule. It'll be a multi-time time capsule. We've watched a lot of movies that have sequels that we have just kind ignored. of ignored. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Will, <laughs> stop smoking. And I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> aye, 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 aye. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host, Devin Decker and Stephen Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.